Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Mr. Rohit Karkera, co-founder and head investments, servant family offices and advisors. Hello, check. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, thanks to Cafe Mutual for organizing a conference on passives. I think it's it's a big, big, big thing for people like us who are pure blood advisors. Like, so when Nishan reached out to us, reached out to us, it was like music for our ears. And I also went through the agenda today. I think I am the only guy speaking about passives in fixed income investing. So we have been hearing about equity ETFs, equity index funds, but. I think this is one asset class which is usually the largest portion of many clients, but the least researched or least talked about as far as investment strategy is concerned. So I think before I get into what are the advantages of passive investing on the fixed income side, let me first ascertain the need for passives in the fixed income space. I think that is the first thing that we need to address. The biggest debate is active versus passive. And uh, while we have literatures on the equity side, I think just to give a global perspective where we come uh, and United States is a classic case where we can relate to and where, what, what, is, what is probably where we would head to over a period of time, almost 80 to 90 percent of the fixed income funds actually underperform the benchmark. This is the SPIVA report. Similar thing is also published on the Indian mutual fund side and, and you also see that many of the mutual funds with due respect to all the active mutual fund managers in the country. Uh, I mean, this is the data, 80 to 90 percent actually underperform the benchmark. So the first starting point is to just realize why you need actually passives in the portfolio. Second and the most important thing is actually in today's context, how does a fixed income manager deliver alpha or how he can actually deliver alpha from a portfolio? What we have seen across multiple active fund managers on the fixed income side, there are two major sources of alpha. One is obviously the strategic factors, which is the duration call or the credit call that a fund manager may take. And second is security selection or, or individual securities that a fund manager buys. Our assessment of what we have seen over the last 10, 15 years, security selection is very tough in the Indian markets for a fund manager, especially on the debt side to create that alpha. So most of the alpha is actually coming from either a duration call or a credit call. I think uh, we have been discussing, the earlier panel also mentioned, 2017 was when uh, 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 DNA of the industry changed, uh, the SEBI categorization came into place, and this is the second most important reason why we feel there is need for passives in the portfolio. Because if you see the SEBI categorization and the definitions, the categories are aligned or there is a range which is given by SEBI, in terms of how much duration allocation, how much credit allocation they can take across categories. Now imagine if most of your alpha earlier was coming only from duration and credit, and after this 2017 circular where SEBI has actually straight jacketed categories, it's gonna be, I mean, we felt it's be, it will be very difficult for the fund managers to actually deliver alpha in future. I remember 10 years back when we used to do the Crystal Mutual Fund rankings, the performance of the best guy and the worst guy, there was a decent alpha which we could see across categories. But today when we do mutual fund assessment, the performance of the best guy and the worst guy is hardly much because the range of differential returns for the fund managers in the same category is not much. This is one of the important reasons why we, there is need for passives in, in at least on the fixed income side. Coming to the advantage of, of passive investing, I think we have spoken about the elimination of the manager risk and the lower cost of, uh, I mean, since the morning. We have spoken about that. But for advisors like us, I think, and, and also for investors, the two, three things is one is the knowledge about the portfolio. You have complete transparency today in terms of what are the portfolio constituents. You have clarity on the maturity profile, the credit profile of the underlying products which is there. So whenever uh, an advisor like us or an investor is constructing a portfolio, he has clear knowledge what the underlying is, what is the tenure of the product, and what is the credit quality of the underlying portfolio that he's getting into. Lastly, and I think it's very important in the Indian context, I think, I think we should also lord, uh, we have well-established houses, Aman was speaking in the earlier panel, right, uh, who, who have a very transparent process of benchmark construction. 
Uh, their methodologies are available on their websites. It's pretty straightforward in terms of access to those methodologies. I think we have a very clear, transparent way in which underlying benchmarks are created so that we can replicate or the fund managers can replicate those benchmarks. So these are the five major advantages which, which we feel are, are in favor of passive investing on the fixed income side. Now, how the evaluation or the evolution of passive industry has happened, especially on the debt side in India? I think two, three pointers on that. Firstly, SEBI categorization is something which I spoke about. Secondly, what happened in after, just after the SEBI categorization came in 2018, we had this huge LNFS crisis and the interest in FMPs. FMPs was a major product for many, many uh, clients and investors. So the interest in FMPs and the industry category FMPs declined in a big way, right? From 1,40 crore crores, today it's almost as good as nothing in terms of AM. This was the reason, uh, this would, I would say this is the genesis of why target maturity funds actually came into the picture. Then after that, we had some categories like roll down funds, right? So industry tried to fix the gap which the FMPs left. They tried launching roll down funds in the industry. They said, sir, this is like an open-ended FMP, if I may use that word. Uh, it's an FMP product where the fund manager follows a roll down strategy. It's like a passive fund, but on an open-ended platform. But the unfortunate thing was there's no SEBI mandate or clarity or transparency in terms of what that fund manager could do in terms of underlying strategies. So for example, this is the actual example of a particular fund. I wouldn't want to name the fund house or the fund here. This fund in 2019 said he will follow a four-year roll-down strategy. So investors came in. This fund was supposed to follow a roll-down strategy till 2023. But early 2022, the fund manager decided to change the tenor and it, he changed the duration straight away. So people who came in this category said, yeah, how could the fund manager change this category? And, and, and that's how we saw many rolled on funds. I mean, some rolled on funds are still following that strategy, but this risk was always there. This was the genesis of actually launch of target maturity funds. And that's how the debt industry the, or the passive industry has evolved to plug this gap left by FMPs and the so-called issues which we saw in open-ended rolled on funds. So debt passive industry, which is gaining traction regularly, and this is, this is how we see from almost negligible AM in the last three years, the AM of passive industry on the debt side has increased to almost 180 crores, predominantly dominated by target maturity funds. And if you see the AM, the AM of FMPs was 140,000 crores uh, initially. Target maturity funds is today almost 90% uh, of the 180,000 crore passive industry. So I would say target maturity funds have actually replaced FMPs. So it's a like-to-like -like product comparison. You call them passive, but we haven't seen real passive products. What you see globally, we, don't, we haven't seen those kind of passive products in India as of now. We have just filled a gap as far as the void which the FMPs had left. Uh, I, I remember 10, 12 years back, uh, and Samir would also uh, uh, understand, right? Passives, when, when we used to speak about passives at that point of time, uh, not many people agreed with us that passives will be a big wave, right? But today we, are talk we have a conference on that where we are talking about passives. Uh, similar thing, we, are, we feel we are at the cusp of passive investing on the fixed income side also. There is a lot of scope. There is a lot of need for actually passive investing for client portfolios. And we are actually standing on that, which I feel 13, 14 years back, we are standing on the equity passive side. We are at the same space as far as the passive investing on the fixed income side is concerned. Uh, now, coming to the portfolio construction space, and I, I specifically wanted to put this slide because a lot of clients, and, and we cater to ultra HNIs and family offices, they say, fixed income, boring air. I mean, I mean passive, koi bhi fund lelo, dal do. Uh, but I always tell them passive investing in fixed income is much more difficult than passive investing in equity. Because in equity, I mean, you can take a nifty 50, which is 60-70% of India's market cap and then you do an SIP in those product categories. But in fixed income, you actually need to go through a lot of process, right? So we have people who are talking about how do you handle your clients? How do you tell which product to invest in? In fixed income, and these are basic filters or elements that you need to look at in a fixed income product. So first is obviously the outlook on the debt markets. What is the expectation on policy rate? What is the expectation on the bond yields? Once you are 
I mean, once you have a sense of that, the next is which part of the yield curve you need to be. There was a time, I'm sure all of us will be aware, uh, three, four months back, the three-year yield and the 10-year yield was almost similar. So why invest in a Bharat bond, which is 2030, right? Invest in a 2025, 2026. Because on a risk-adjusted return basis, that's a much better part to be. Then spreads. There was six months back, the SDL spreads were attractive. Today, the corporate bond spreads are attractive. Which product to select based on that? And once you decide on that, the third is comes the choice of products. So in passives, we only talk about target maturity funds. But today, if duration is a call, why are not, not many constant maturity funds in the industry, people who want to take duration bets? And I mean, easily you can generate 10 plus return going forward onwards if your duration call is actually right. So whether it's a mark-to-market product or a HTM product is the next call. And finally, benchmark evaluation, right? So you have index providers like NSC, Chrisil, who, who, who provide index, multiple indices, but for advisors like us, it also becomes very important to evaluate which benchmark is relevant for a client. So the net-net, what I'm trying to say, it's not as easy as equity investment or a passive investment equity. There are multiple factors that we need to take into account because before passive investing in debt. Uh, lastly, I think my uh, uh, two bits is in terms of what are the challenges and what are the opportunities that we see in this space. Firstly, if you look at the underlying AUM of all the passive funds in the industry, majority of that is invested in GSEX, SDLs, and AAA PSUs. You hardly have any exposures to private uh, companies, even AAA companies. Even though, I mean, you have decent issuance sizes happening on the AAA corporate side, probably this is something which is missing, which is the need for client portfolios today. Secondly, you have a whole variety of maturities as far as target maturity funds are concerned. Now, which target maturity bucket one has to invest? That's a call ultimately people like us, advisors like us have to handle the clients also. So that, these are the challenges that we feel is there, still there in the passive industry space. Uh, I think what, from an advisor's perspective, what we see gaps in client portfolios and which we feel is an immediate requirement. And uh, to assess, I mean, to address this, I think all of us, AMCs, partners like us, index providers, uh, have to actually come together and maybe find a solution for that. The first is, the TMF industry today is predominantly PSU, SDLs, as I said, mentioned. There is probably need for some kind of private corporate exposures. Obviously, there are concerns on liquidity, etc. But I'm sure we have brains uh, in this room who can put across some kind of products on that. A mix of sovereign and AAA PSUs, uh, AAA private companies, what we probably need. We also need focused non-PSU, AAA, uh, non-PSU kind of uh, TMFs also, because that's the need which is there in many of our client portfolio, at least. Secondly, I think the high yield options. Today, uh, while, while there is credit risk funds which are there, I think there is a huge gap which we see from a mutual fund industry. Somebody who wants to take a high yield credit exposure, the only options that are available are there on the AIF structure. And that's a huge gap in terms of the risk, which can be captured by these kind of products. Because today we are happy with a 7%, 7.25% YTM on a AAA space. But 18 months down the line, when interest rates start going down, people will ask for high yield options, especially now that the taxation advantage is out of the window. So I think these were the things which we feel, which the passive industry will evolve in future. I'm sure that will happen. But, uh, but, but we still have a long way to go and we have actually made a good start. So I think that that's, was it from my end. Thank you so much, guys.